In today's video, we're looking at the unique city of Venice. Venice is in the northeast of Italy. Italy is kind of shaped like a boot and Venice is basically in the top right hand corner. Venice is extremely famous for its waterways. Venice is built on an archipelago of islands, which means a group or collection of islands. There's 118 islands in total. They go over the shallow Venice lagoon. There's 400 bridges connecting these islands and over 177 canals. So as you can't really get around by car, Venice is very famous for its gondolas. It's Europe's largest car-free urban area and has remained fully functioning uh, throughout the 21st century so far without any motor cars or trucks. Pretty good going, especially for carbon footprint. Nowadays, the classic Venetian boat of the gondola is used mainly by tourists and for funerals and weddings. And there are about 400 that are licensed in the city and they're very distinctive. They're sort of long and flat and uh, there's an oarsman with a very long oar at one end. Two centuries ago, there used to be 10,000 gondolas. Venice is a UNESCO World Heritage Site because it's so unique. Venice has always been a centre for culture as well and it has inspired many artists, painters and musicians and also even William Shakespeare. Many writers were influenced by Venice with Othello and the Merchant of Venice being set in the fine city itself. Venice is often known as the City of Bridges, the City of Water and the Floating City. It's also known as the City of Masks, and that's because Venice is famous for its Venetian mask. The Venetian masks were originally worn at the Carnival of Venice, and they were so that people could masquerade in society and act more loosely and freely incognito, i.e. meaning so no one could know who they were. So here are five other facts about Venice. Number five, houses in Venice are numbered according to districts, not streets. So it makes it really difficult even for postmen to find addresses. Often you have to look for a nearby landmark. Number four, in 1608, it was outlawed to wear a mask unless it was carnival time. And if you broke the rules, you were heavily punished. Number three. Venice is sinking at a rate of one to two millimetres a year. Venice had the world's first public casino, which opened in 1638. Venice is actually built on logs, millions of logs that have been driven into the ground. They're made from alder trees, which are known for their water resistance. So there you go, a beginner's guide to Venice. Now, today's story is all set in Venice. It's called The Mask of Arabella by Anna Houghton. The Mask of Arabella by Anna Houghton. Magic is believing in yourself. If you can do that, you can make anything happen. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Chapter One. Arabella and her friend Theo sat side by side on the deck of the fishing boat, looking out across the lagoon to their island home. Already, Burano's brightly coloured cottages were dissolving into the distance. It was the last morning of September, the day before Arabella's 13th birthday. Aren't you going to help? Theo's papa called, struggling with the sail. The others are leaving us behind. Theo rolled his eyes, but sprang to his feet. Arabella stayed where she was. Girls were bad luck on boats, so fishing folk said. Thankfully, Theo's papa wasn't as superstitious as the rest of them and allowed Arabella on board. But he drew the line at her handling the sail. Since he was already doing her a kindness, she didn't complain. All the same, she watched Theo keenly as he wrestled with the ropes, trying to learn as much as she could. The dirty old sail whipped about the creaking mast, then billowed and caught. Theo let out a small whoop of triumph. Bravo, his papa called, angling the rudder. The ancient fishing boat began to move smoothly across the dark water, gathering momentum, and soon joined the small fleet sailing towards the main island of Venice. Sleepy-eyed boys regarded Arabella warily from the decks of the other boats. She dropped her gaze, used to these sorts of looks. Theo flopped back down beside her. Still don't get why you want to come, 
he said, dipping the toe of his boot into the passing water. I have to, but you, you could spend the morning exploring rooftops or playing with Luna or swimming or... I like coming, interrupted Arabella, wrapping her cloak around her body. Theo snorted. No one likes getting covered in fish guts. I don't mind, she insisted. Suit yourself, Theo scoffed, but he was smiling. The lagoon and sky lightened to orange and pink. The world was soft and hazy like the edge of a dream. Other fishermen called greetings to Theo's papa, which he returned cheerily. Arabella felt a tug of yearning as she looked up at his open bearded face. He was so bright and full of life, so unlike her father. Arabella loved helping at the fish market, the pescheria, because... Just for a short while, it made her feel that she was part of something, that she belonged, and though she felt guilty for admitting it, she relished the excuse to be out of Papa's gloomy house, where he sat day after day making his beautiful lace in silent mourning. It had been ten years since Mama had passed, but Papa had never recovered. Arabella had been an infant, but could barely remember her. She worried about Papa constantly, except at the market, where she was so busy she could forget for a while though she'd feel bad about that afterwards. Theo leant back on his elbows and closed his eyes. Arabella kept hers open, gazing at the other islands as they floated by. There was Sant Arasmo, dotted with farms that produced fruits and vegetables for the whole city. Some Burano boys had once tried to steal artichokes there and had been chased off with sticks. Lots more boats were setting off from the island's jetty on their way to market. Next was Murano, the renowned glassblower's island. Then San Michel, the cemetery island. Gulls cried on the horizon and the sun slid out of the lagoon. Thin trails of pale blue ribboned the sky and the main island of Venice came dazzlingly into view. Piazzo San Marco was already full of crowds. The rising sun shone off the red brick of the bell tower. The campanile and the pale walls of the doge's palace gleamed. It was low and rectangular, decorated like the most beautiful cake with a pattern of stone arches that were as intricate as Papa's lace. Rows of dark windows looked out towards the lagoon like the eye holes of a Venetian mask. As their boat got closer, she made out the carving of the head of a lion in the palace wall, its jaws open. The lion's mouth. She was too far away to read the inscription engraved underneath, but she knew what it said. Even children who couldn't read knew. Per de Monti Segret. For secret accusations. Parents warned naughty children that their names would be put into the lion's mouth and the doge's guards would come and punish them. Of course, it wasn't really for disobedient children. Anyone seen as dangerous could have had their name placed in the lion's mouth at any time by anyone. No one knew what happened to them after the guards came. Some said they were thrown into the palace prison. Others, that they were hanged between the columns in Piazza San Marco in the dead of night. One thing was for sure you didn't want to find out. Arabella shivered. Hello, Arabella. Theo waved a hand in front of her eyes. Sorry, I, I was miles away, she smiled. What were you saying? But whatever it was, it was forgotten because the next instant Theo jumped to his feet, making the boat rock and pointed, shouting, Santo Cielo, it's the doge. Sure enough, sweeping ahead of them, moving far, far faster than the fishing boats, was a fleet of elegant gondolas, steered by masked palace guards, and seated in the middle gondola, recognisable by his snow-white robes and glittering diamond mask, was the doge of Venice. Arabella jumped to her feet too. The doge had not been outside the palace for months and had been ill for years. A cheer rose up as he raised a gloved hand and waved. He had always been generous to the poor, at least before he fell ill. Good to see him up and about, said Theo's papa. The doge turned towards them and his jewelled mask flashed blindingly in the sun so that Arabella had to close her eyes when she opened them again. The doge had turned back towards the palace. Do you think he wears a mask to hide how poorly he is? She asked Theo. Theo shrugged. Maybe. I remember seeing him when I was little and I swear he didn't wear a mask then. You weren't even born, he teased, adding. He probably just likes it. If I owned a mask with that many jewels on, I'd wear it all the time too. Though it's not his mask I'd want. It's the gondolas, Arabella finished. Theo smiled. Just look at them. They're so fast. Do you know that they're made from several different types of wood? Oak, cherry, elm, pine? As a matter of fact, Arabella did know because Theo had already told her many times. 
And they're deliberately lopsided to counterbalance the weight of the rower at the back, he continued. And that curved bit at the front, that's called the ferro, isn't it, Papa? I'd love to own a gondola one day. <sighs> Theo sighed wistfully. Theo's Papa rolled his eyes and ignored him. Maybe you will, Arabella, said encouragingly. Theo only sighed again and Arabella regretted her words. She knew what Theo was thinking. Only those born into rich Venetian families got to own gondolas. Theo would be a fisherman all his life like his father and grandfather before him. Still, at least he knew his place in the world. Arabella envied the clearness of his path. Her own was as murky as canal water. The palace fleet reached the jetty. The doge stepped from his gondola and disappeared through an archway into the palace, followed by his guards. A few fishermen let out groans of disappointment to see him go, calling out wishes for his good health. The fishing boats swung away from the palace, moved past the Campanile and entered the Grand Canal, the main waterway of the city, which snaked in an S-curve through the main island. This morning, as on all mornings except Sundays, it was a sparkling ribbon of activity, packed with trading boats laden with wares, bright tomatoes and flashing sardines among them. More traders called greetings to Theo's papa. Ciao, buongiorno, Theo's papa called back, and Arabella glo glowed with pride just to be on the same boat. She gazed up at the grand palazzos on either side of the Grand Canal that were the homes of Venice's richest families. The flower-covered balconies, beautiful jetties and arched entrances were a world away from the higgledy-piggledy cottages on Burano. Many were worthy rivals to the Doge's palace itself and the sun slid from window to window as if it couldn't decide which to stay in. Arabella and Theo spent many morning journeys fantasising about what it might be like to live in a palazzo. Theo always teased Arabella about her favourite, which was halfway along the Grand Canal just before the Rialto Bridge. The orange and purple stained glass windows were smashed and boarded up and the canary yellow paint was peeling. But it was a wonder it hadn't been torn down and Arabella was glad it hadn't. There was just something about it that she liked. The world was suddenly cold and dark as their fishing boats slipped into the shadow beneath the Rialto Bridge. Arabella and Theo played their usual game of touching the underside with their fingers. It had seemed so tricky when they were young and small, but now they could both reach the slimy bricks with ease. It reminded Arabella that her days following Theo to the market were numbered. Thirteen was considered an adult by some. Theo was going to be a fisherman, but what would she become? A lace maker like Papa. She was clumsy and awful at sewing. But how else would she and Papa survive when his eyesight worsened as it surely would? She pushed these worries from her mind as they emerged back into the bright sunshine and on the other side of the bridge. As usual, she caught the smell of the pescharia, a pungent, salty odour that she'd grown to love even before she saw the colourful mishmash of stools crammed under the arches of the loggia. Theo's papa docked the boat on the trader's jetty and went ahead to set up the stall, leaving Arabella and Theo to unload the fish. The crates were half empty today, just as they had been all year. The recent decline of fish in the lagoon was making every family on Burano anxious. No one could afford to lose money. Bad catch again this week, Theo muttered. Everyone's in the same boat, a nearby fisherman remarked. Must be a change in the swell or something. Pa called another, his expression dark. It's been eight months of this. I'll tell you the real reason. Fortune teller said a blood moon's coming. And you know what that means. What? asked the first fisherman. It's a bad omen. Very bad indeed. The second man gave Arabella a suspicious look. She pretended not to see. I love that story and I can tell that reading on in that book you'll find out more about Venice and what it's like to be there. It's very descriptive, um, very nice indeed. Now the mask of Arabella could well be referring to a Venetian mask considering it's set in Venice. Now as I said Venetian masks became very popular because of the Venice Carnival and as well as keeping people in disguise and incognito I should point out that they were also designed to mean that people were on an even playing field so you wouldn't know if someone was a nobleman or a servant so you'd treat everyone the same which is also a really really good quality and very egalitarian very just 
and fair. I thought it might be fun if we had a go at making a Venetian mask today. Now, Venetian masks are really flamboyant, as you can imagine from the fact that they were made for the carnival. So to make these masks, you need to get to collecting lots of things like shiny foil, because they might have been very glitzy. So if you've got any chocolate bars with foil on or kitchen foil knocking about, um, also milk bottle lids, sequins, feathers and things that are bright colours, so hot pinks and reds, you know, as well as your metallic golds and silvers. Um, so you could cut out bits and pieces from magazines that seem vibrant and colourful because that's what we'll be using to decorate our masks. But to kick off, what we're going to do is get some cardboard. I'm going to use the cardboard from a pizza packet, but a cereal box is good. Any cardboard that you can find in recycling and you need to get enough for the width of your face because um, that is obviously going to be the size of our mask. Now, the Venetian mask that we're going to make today is going to be the type that just covers your eyes um, as opposed to a full face mask. So... Um, yeah, you don't have to have a cereal packet or anything as big as your whole face, but as long as you cover this strip, then you're sorted. And you need to cut out a rectangle to the size of that strip. I've got quite a small head. Um, now, often when you're making things, you'll use the back of your card because you don't want, you know, the packaging... Um, or the brand logo to show but I always think if you're using the font on something like this it's good because it might be a bright colour already um, and that means that you don't have to paint it because we're going to cover all the bits so we can cover any writing that says Rice Krispies or whatever with the stuff we stick on. Next you need to draw the shape of your mask and the great thing about this is it doesn't matter if it's wonky because it's carnival and it's flamboyant and it doesn't have to be exactly right. So you can see this kind of shape where it goes up at the edges is a really good way to do it because it says to me carnival. So see if you can make a shape similar to that. And as you can see, mine isn't totally symmetrical, but it doesn't really matter. So next I'm going to cut it out. So there we go. Mine is totally not symmetrical, but I think that's part of the sort of carnival, weird and kooky and mysterious vibe. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm just gently going to feel roughly where my eyes are and mark a little dot on each side where I can feel my eyes are. There we go. And now I'm going to cut a circle or rather an oval shape at each eye. Now this bit is tricky because when you're cutting into card, um, it can be dangerous. So you might need to get an adult to help. So I've gone for quite a big eye shape there. And then if there's jaggedy edges like that, just take your nail or your finger and just score it round a bit. And you'll find that you can smooth out the edges quite a bit. And then we need to repeat the same thing on the other side. I'm quite happy with mine. So I'm ready to decorate. And as I said, I'm going to stick onto this side. So I've got my red as my background. So here's a progress update. I've nearly covered all of my writing. And what's good about the foil is you can just bend it around on the inside and glue it on the inside. So you get a really smooth edge around the eyes and obviously foil looks really decadent because it's shiny and glitzy so there you can see I've stuck all my bits of foil over the top of my mask and now what I think is a really good touch is to cut out sort of eyebrow shapes and then to stick them on and you can have them coming off the top there like that so I've coloured in my eyebrows and that's really good for your mask to have a centrepiece like you could put say a feather in the middle and then things on each edge. So I found a bright blue box here, I'm going to cut out a few shapes and stick them on. So there you go, I finished sticking all my bits on. As you can see, boxes come in handy if they're in bright colours, if you've got any Easter egg 
cartons knocking about or cereal packets just cut bright shapes out and then anything that comes off the edge looks really good especially at the corners and in the middle if you can't find feathers you could always get some tissue paper or crepe paper of bright colors and make feather shapes and stick them on so that all that remains to be done is for me to get some sticky tape and stick my stick on the side you could use a stick that you find in the park for instance or you could do what I'm doing and uh, use a chopstick even a pencil would work for this so this is the finished article and I'm ready to go to Venice Carnival um, and celebrate and party hope you've enjoyed this video please subscribe and spread the word